<laughs> so thanks so much for having me. Um, I see that many of you are eating now, and so I don't want to disturb you, um, disturb your breakfast just yet. Uh, you all should have received your anonymous surveys, so you should not be putting your name on it. And once you have completed your survey, you're just going to pass it to the front. All right, so as we're working through that, I want to go ahead and get started. I'll be talking with you all about self-care. I'm glad that it's Friday, first of all. Raise your hand if you're glad it's Friday. OK, so I'm not alone with that, in that. And um, you know, there's nothing worse than going to a training that we need for our CEUs. I'm just going to keep it real. And being bored like five minutes in and trying to figure out how you're going to stay awake for the rest of the time. So this, this, I want you all to be able to keep, to just try to keep an open mind. This presentation is going to be a little different. I'm an expressive arts therapist by trade, and so I like to share that with um, people. And you know, there's a lot of choice involved, and I'll share a little bit more about how I made my way to that um, modality. But so I'm saying all that to say, I've got some coloring pages. I've got some blank pages. I've got oil pastels, markers, and colored pencils. Now, you have to be respectful of your colleagues that are occupying those spaces. That this is going to be a training where you can get up and walk around if you feel like you want to color um, or while you listen. For some of us, I'm in that club. I actually listen better when I'm using my hands. So you get to do that as long as it's not disruptive to, to other people in the room. And we'll be building upon that as we move forward. So as I mentioned, as I was you know, preparing this um, workshop, I felt really excited. Um, in terms of self-care, I'll just share a little bit. You know, my journey to self-care has been, you know, it's iterative, right? It's something that's always, always evolving. And I started out my career in public mental health in Washington, D.C., working with children who had been impacted by domestic violence. And it was really tough work, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I did play therapy with that population, and I went on to work in many public mental health agencies uh, throughout the city. Um, at the time that I had transitioned into private practice, uh, my team was the top earning uh, team in, in our division. I had just um, been awarded the Employee of the Year uh, award, and on the outside, everything looked copacetic. That I, this is, I'm going to keep it real, and my style of presentation is pretty antidotal. But there became a point where, even though I was living in Southern Maryland and, and commuting all the way to DC every day, I did not remember my commute. I don't remember getting in the car. I don't remember starting the car. Somehow, magically, I would end up at work. And then when it was time for me to go home, which was usually after everyone else had gone home, there was a reason why I was employee of the year, overachieving and overcompensating. The same thing would happen in in back to back traffic hour and a half two hours each way and so i know a little bit about how important self care is at the time i had been diagnosed with an um, a female reproductive uh, situation and the question was about like whether i should go you know pursue surgery or some alternate methods of course my agency wanted me to undergo the surgery because that would get me back working for them very, very quickly. And that I elected not to do the surgery. And I elected without really having a very clear compass, I elected to leave the agency and start my own private practice. I was told that you know, my private practice was not going to work, um, that people only you know, utilize public mental health services. I was told everything under the sun. And um, that was really hard. 
So to just so so basically, after I you know decided to leave for my leave for private practice, two months after leaving, even though my practice wasn't fully running, my condition repaired itself. The doctors said I made an unprecedented recovery. They have no idea what could have happened. And the only thing that was different was that I left that agency. That's the only thing that was different. So I just want to qualify and let you all know that I know what it's like to have so much paperwork you can't see straight. I know what it's like to not know whether you should go to your best friend's birthday party or to be so tired that you can't even figure out whether you're going to go. I know what it's like to get all the way to work and know that you know the wallet is at home. I know what it's like to think maybe I left my cell phone in the bathroom or maybe it fell on the floor ground while I was getting out of the car. I know all of that. I know what it's like to feel like I, you can't do another thing. They can't, you don't even want the raise. Just don't give me any more work. <laughs> you know, just keep the money and let me keep, keep the little bit of sanity that I have. So I, I just wanted to let you know that I know what that's like. And then I also too know what it's like to be able to show up to work when I'm at my, at my best. My work day starts around 10 and it ends around 2. Um, and I know what it's like to take a vacation without worrying about whether a supervisor is going to be calling me while I'm on vacation to ask me about my notes, um, being caught up on my treatment plans. And I know what it's like. Um, to really relax and to settle in and enjoy a time off without worrying about how the, the moment I step back into that agency, it's like I never had a vacation. They just suck all the life out of you and you think, did I even have a vacation? The only way you know that you did is because you have a few pictures to show. So that's me a little bit. Um, so we'll be talking about self-care and how to foster res resilience and wellness and want you all to be thinking a little bit about what that looks for you in your life right now. What would self-care look for you, look like for you in your life right now? So today we're gonna learn three research-based trauma terms that every mental health professional should know. And we know, most of us know these terms as it relates to you know, communicating and providing psychoeducation to clients, but I think that you know, we can take a page out of our own books and think about how it, um, how it relates to us. We will identify at least three stress symptom symptoms and the impact that each of these symptoms has on mental health providers. And then we'll learn three evidence-based self-care methods. So as I said, um, I'm, I'm CEO and founder of Urban Playology. We are um, a, 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 a boutique private practice in Washington, DC. We provide transformative psychotherapy and expressive arts therapy. So we have a little therapy dog. We do nature therapy. You'll get a chance to see him too um, on, the, on the presentation. We do um, psychodrama. We work with groups, individuals. Uh, we understand that sometimes talking is just not enough. And we understand that sometimes when people have experienced pervasive trauma, it it, has, it impacts the part of the brain that where our words live. And so people have to be able to have some way to process and heal uh, when talk is really not available to them. You've already completed your anonymous surveys. Most folks want to know what we're going to do. We're going to do some brief intro introductions for those who want to uh, introduce themselves and share your expectations uh, for today, for our time together. We'll have a PowerPoint, which is what we're doing now. We'll take a look at some media. Um, we'll have a break and uh, we'll move right into self-care. You know, sometimes you go to a training and you're so eager to kind of try to utilize some of what you learn. We're going to be learning and then we're going to be utilizing before you leave here today. We'll have our final remarks um, our, and um, you'll complete your evaluations and then you'll get to go home on or wherever your next destination is um, after. And so, you know, we oftentimes hear people say, you know, I'm stressed, I'm stressed out, you know, I'm, I'm stressed. And then, you know, as, I, as I've gotten older, you know, I hear people, as I got older, I kept hearing people say things like, you know, even good stress is bad stress. 
And I used to think, you know, if you run a million dollars, how is that how is that stressful? You know, that over time I've come to understand that the body doesn't know the difference between winning a million dollars or being um, in a car accident. You know, stress is stress. There's three types of stress. Um, there's positive stress uh, that also too releases the stress hormone uh, cortisol. There's a tolerable stress, which is it's serious, mm -hmm. it's temporary, mm -hmm. and it's easily remedied by the um, you know supportive networks that we have in our lives. And then there's the toxic stress, um, somewhat of like what I described, you know, during my time in public mental health. I, I and I just also want to qualify. I absolutely loved working with um, my clients in D.C. They were the only reason why I showed up to work. Um, that it, it's still mm -hmm. a form of toxic stress when you're working, working under a managed health care organization that has a, a bigger bottom line than, than who we are as human beings. So today, we are going to be here to break up with stress. Trauma. Trauma is the emotional, psychological, and physiological residue that's left over from the heightened stress that accompanies experiences of threat, violence, and life-changing events. And it's also too described as a more, over, um, a more overwhelming event than a person would ordinarily expect to encounter. And what's interesting as I was taking a look at the research is that trauma is the number one cause of death and people among age, from age one to 46. That's compelling. And then we see um, heart disease and cancer, and then you know, other, other medical um, conditions. But trauma is 47%, nearly half. Most of us are actually walking around with trauma. Most human beings are walking around with trauma. And for those of us who are doing mental health work, it creates some challenges for us. Um, when we're interfacing with clients, as much as we like to, you know, I know I'm a good person, uh, but that's just not enough when you're trying to provide quality services to clients. Um, you know, I also, too, am a, a professor at my alma mater, and so interfacing with students. Uh, there's research to suggest that when you, um, when your supervisor is stressed, and suffering from burnout, it increases the likelihood that you will begin to suffer from it as well. Mm -hmm. um, interfacing with colleagues, sometimes this work can be isolating, and um, it increases all, that also too increases the likelihood that you'll experience burnout. In this field, we're expected to be superhuman. You know, how many of us, you know, gotten a disturbing text or got a phone call or saw a disturbing email, and you had to meet with a client like three three seconds later? and pretend like that communication didn't even happen. And you're trying to figure out solutions in your head about that situation while you're talking with somebody who's in need. And that in and of itself, those types of exchanges have long-term and short-term implications. When we look at burnout, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma, what do you all see in terms of like the main differences uh, between burnout, compassion fatigue, and vicarious trauma. I mean, we see with burnout that there's fatigue, anger, frustration, negative reactions, cynicism, negativity, and withdrawal. The symptoms are physical, psychological, cognitive, relational, you know, got somebody at home looking, you know, who can't wait to see you, they haven't seen you all day, and you walk through the door and you just don't want to be bothered. Okay. With compassion fatigue, there's sadness and grief because there's an awareness that you're tired and you're trying to get to that place where you were, you know, when you first started this work and you were excited. There's research to suggest that those of us who are, who do a really great job in this work and who are most passionate about this work, uh, are also to at higher risk for experiencing burnout. With compassion fatigue, sometimes there's addiction, uh, nightmares, uh, frequent use of sick days, increased psychological arousal, changes in belief. So, you know, where you might have started, um, you know, working with the families that have been impacted by domestic violence and thinking that they would, 
you know, all overcome it. By the time you transition out of that agency, it's like nobody ever changes. You know, everybody's going to stay the same. People just stay in those messed up relationships and those messed up dynamics until whenever, forever. Um, the symptoms of compassion fatigue also to mirror PTSD. Um, they are physical, they have headaches, digestive problems, muscle tension, fatigue, psychological distress, cognitive shifts, relational disturbances, poor concentration, focus, and judgment. You know, it's time for you to write your note and the cursor is just blinking at you. For the vicarious traumatization, there's anxiety, also to sadness, confusion, apathy, intrusive imagery, loss of control and trust and independence, somatic complaints, relational disturbances. You know, I have a headache, I, my stomach is hurting, but you have no, no real cause for why that's happening. Um, the symptoms also to mirror what we see with PTSD. They're phys they are physical, psychological, and there are cogni cognitive shifts and relational disturbances. And there's triggers for all three of these. And so you don't necessarily have to know the, know the definitions you know, verbatim, but it is important to kind of be able to check in with yourself and think about where you might be falling on this, on this scale. Because if you don't know where you are, how can you create a self-care self plan that's going to help address that? When people experience vicarious trauma, um, you know, for me, the vicarious trauma happens at work. You know, you have no idea what clients are going to share. And sometimes it's beyond words. You know, you, you cannot believe um, some of the tough things that people are going through. It causes a change in our worldview. And there's a spectrum of responses. Um, there's the vicarious traumatization and the secondary traumatic stress and the compassion fatigue. And when we try to manage those things, uh, we move towards a place of neutrality. But one of the things to know is that once you have burnout, it never goes away. So the best way to deal with burnout is to try not to get it. Okay? And then try not to pass it on to somebody else. It's pretty contagious in that regard. Um, but I do believe that burnout is a great way for us to, to know. It's like a litmus, a litmus test, a, a prompt for understanding, OK, now I've got I to take care of myself. When you're feeling more burnout, you know, you know that you have to take care of yourself. Um, one of the other positive impacts of, uh, of burnout and vicarious trauma is that you know, whatever you focus on gets bigger. So when we think about trauma, vicarious trauma, what we hear clients talking about that's upsetting, what about the things that they share that are just amazing? Sometimes they have breakthroughs, sometimes there's something really wonderful that's happened in their lives, and as, and as clinicians, as their providers, as their helpers, as their trained helpers, we get to celebrate that, celebrate those milestones as well. Um, we can have compassion and, and actually have a level of satisfaction. Every day I go to work um, with my little doggy, I'm so excited. I cannot wait to get to work. As we mentioned before, when we experience these, these traumas, um, you know, we take a look at the brain, you know, we look at the motor areas, we look at the sensory areas, uh, the frontal lobe. Uh, there's these areas, what I want, what the takeaway for, for you from this is to be thinking about what areas are you feeling most compromised in, you know? So if you're having trouble concentrating, if you're having trouble um, getting your words together, if you're having trouble uh, with your vision, if you're having trouble with that language comp uh, comprehension, uh, have you ever been in a situation where somebody says something to you and you're like, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? What did you say? And it's not because you're having, you know, you're hard of hearing. It's because you're having a hard time comprehending what they've, what they've shared. It's something to think about. Um, if your posture and balance and coordination of movement um, are in question outside of going to, to yoga, it, it's, that gives you information about, you know, what your self-care might need to might need to include. And so when we talk about the impact and the implications of all of this, I want to share some of the research that I 
found about uh, mental health professionals and what happens when they experience um, trauma. So I wanted to show you this. Uh, here we have uh, a healthy brain and a traumatized brain. Um, these are um, PET scans from young, young children. And what do you notice uh, about what you're seeing here in the, in the brain? So here you have the healthy brain, and here are your levels of activity. And then you have the, the abused brain. So what do you notice? Anybody? Absence. So we have like a Swiss cheese appearance, right? All right. For the young person who has experienced trauma. All right. um, for this particular child, they had been raised in an orphanage. And uh, they had been institutionalized shortly after birth, so they had very little contact. And um, that what's wonderful is that uh, have you ever been in a situation where you said, "I'm upset. I, pro I know what you're probably going to say. I don't want you to say anything. Just listen to me, or just sit with me for a second while I get myself together." Um, there's something to that. Uh, research shows that when you're in th in this space with somebody who genuinely cares about you. Um, without talking, the myelin sheaths of the, of the brain actually begin to repair themselves. So these areas actually begin to repair themselves. So, you know, when I'm doing clinical supervision with, with students and supervisees, it's important for them to know that you don't, you don't, we don't have to be superhuman. The fact that we care, uh, we don't have to always know the right thing to say. The fact that we care and the fact that we're actually occupying physical proximity to clients actually is having a healing effect. So really being able to use our bodies as an instrument and, and letting that be enough because sometimes we feel like it's not, but that actually can be enough. There's a global impact of clinician burnout as well. When they interviewed uh, doctors, physicians and, and particularly, what they found was that both in the personal, personal realm and in the professional realm, there were things that were happening that were not good. Um, uh, that many of them are struggling with broken relationships. If we think about like attorneys and physicians, they have the highest divorce rate. And we, those of us that are mental health professionals, we're swiftly climbing to those same numbers, just so you know. Um, the rate of alcohol and substance use was higher. The rate of uh, depression was higher. And the rate of suicidality was higher. So this is not just attempts. This is actually, you know, completed suicide. Um, there was a decreased quality of care and increased medical errors. You know, um, there was decreased patient satisfaction. I always say that uh, that clients and patients speak with their feet. You know, when they start complaining, um, you know, that's information for us. Um, and I don't. I I think that we need to spend a little bit of time exploring what the complaints are. I don't think we sh should necessarily be dismissive and write it off to their mental health because. By the time people make it to therapy, you know, they've tried everything else, and they're pretty keen. Uh, they just need support around these issues that they're, that they're dealing with. Uh, decreased productivity and professional effort. You know, by the time uh, I left one agency, I had so many progress notes. It, it took me like 24 hours to take a look at everything that the team had submitted. And um, I had no idea. I don't think that I would have known how much work I had unless I was transitioning out of the, out of the role. So that was compelling. And then turnover. Every time you go to work, you see a new face. Every time you go to work, you see a new face. And after a while, you're the only one you remember, you know? <laughs> And they took a look at the clinical and the non-clinical populations. In the non-clinical population, 84% of people uh, reported that they had experienced at least one tra traumatic event. While I was in graduate training for my, um, you know, for counseling in, in graduate school, we were taught to assume that people had been traumatized until proven otherwise. And I thought, well, how dismal is that? You know, but over time, as I moved forward in, in the work, you know, nearly 20 years, I understand now better what they meant. 
33% reported having over four or more traumatic events. Okay, so when we think about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, 33% um, of people have had four or more traumatic events. When they took a look at counselors um, and counseling students, and I, I include this because, you know, we oftentimes focus on clinicians that are actually in the work. That counseling students, you know, in my day-to-day -day work with counseling students, they experience a lot of trauma. Um, and they don't necessarily have the training to go along with, you know, with the, with the exposure. 41.7% uh, of them indicated having a personal event um, that was a source of traumatic stress. Uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, I had three deaths in my family, back to back, um, devastating. 45.8% uh, um, indicated that an event with a friend or a family member was a source of traumatic stress as well. And a traumatic stress can be, you know, talking to your mom and, and her saying, you know, I haven't seen you in forever. You know, how long are you going to be at that job or how long are you going to be in this school? Like, you know, you, you know, we're your family. We miss you. That's traumatic stress, especially for somebody who feels like, you know, I'm doing this for, my, for the family so that I can help, you know, leave a legacy. That can be very tough uh, for, for students and for clinicians. And when people experience that trauma, sometimes we have countertransference. So when in my work with students, before they even share what the diagnosis with, what I want to know is how they're being triggered by the client. Because those triggers help give you information about how to move forward um, in, in working with that client. Uh, Countertransference occurs when counselors are experiencing trauma. Um, Countertransference occurs when, when counselors experience trauma based on what clients are sharing with them. Um, there starts to be this withdrawal in the, in the counseling relationship, withdrawal in supervision, um, inability to engage in self-care. Uh, we talked about this earlier, just the disruption of the worldview and the phenomenological view. I don't know if any of you have ever had, had a friend. You all seemed like you were on the same page in the work. You felt really good about it. And now every time you go to lunch with this person, you're hoping that the lunch ends really quickly because all they, all they do is complain or, um, it, you know, you're having a hard time relating to them now because they're now not feeling very good about being in the work. Um, we begin judging groups of people, all people, for example, all people who belong to a race of their trauma perpetrator are bad or all men are uh, sexual predators. These are some of the things that can happen. Um, feelings of hopelessness and feelings of vulnerability and just a, an overall sense of not feeling safe. In 2007, they took a look at um, social workers, and 50% of them experienced, said that they experienced vicarious trauma one week after interacting with clients who had experienced trauma. So I want to make sure you all understand what happens. Social worker goes into the room. They, they sit across from the client. The client shares the traumatic event. The session is over. That traumatic event has been stored in the social worker's bones. It's, it's been stored, and it's been stored so, to, to such a degree that one week after having met with that client, they began to experience vicarious trauma. 25% okay. of them said that they had hyperarousal, just anxious. Uh, when they took a look at psychologists, and I wanted to include all of the different disciplines because you know there's psychology, counseling, social work, um, you know, case management, you know, we're, we are all trained helpers. And when they take a look, took a look at psychologists, they found that 75% had experienced distress in the, in the previous three years. 37% admitted that the distress that they were under um, adversely impacted the quality of care. Have you ever gotten mm -hmm. a client gotten assigned with a client says, you know, I'm glad you're, I'm working with you because the person I was working with before was trash, right? Um, and, that, and they said that, you know, in, the, in this same study, they said that 4.6% 4, 4. of them actually acknowledged that they didn't do a good job. 
that their care was inadequate, that if they could, if they could go back and do it, they would either have transferred to clients or um, you know, just not, not met with them at all, practice self-care for themselves that day. And so again, I want, I want to encourage you all to always pay attention to client feedback when clients come in or when, you know, you're, when they come in and they look at you and they, are you okay? <laughs> I, I bought this coffee for myself. I haven't drank it. Do you want it? <laughs> information, information for us. So just so that you understand like concretely what, what this burnout looks like, you know, if you are already waiting for this, ready for the session to be over before it even starts, if you're hoping this person cancels, okay? If you are rolling your eyes as you're walking to the lobby to go escort them back to your office, um, if you are wishing that you were doing something else or counting down the session, you know, it's 4.15, you look at the clock again, it's 4.16, okay? Or if you're ending sessions early, I think that's enough for today. I think, we, I think we're at a good, a good point now, you know. Um, you seem to be moving forward. Um, thanks so much for sharing. And um, why don't you come back in two weeks or maybe in a month? You know, and the client's like, well, I'd like to come back next week. Okay, well, um, just send me an email and we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, anger or resentment towards the client, right? You know, the client who... Um, you know, is verbose or talks a lot because they really enjoy being, you know, in, in session with you. Um, why do you talk so much? You know, these are the thoughts that are going through your mind. Why, do you, why are you talking so much? I can't get a word in edgewise. I don't even know if I'm helping you. Um, you know, irritation and resentment towards the client. All of these are concrete ways that you might be experiencing burnout. Okay. I put this in here because if, as we look at the American... Um, Psychological Association. When I first started in this work, when there were infractions, ethical infractions that um, you know people uh, that 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 counselors ha were being you know accused of, um, it was just about the infraction and and nothing else. Now. For those of you who are, who are licensed, you want to go back and take a look at your eth code of ethics because now when, when we are being accused of some infraction, the licensing boards want proof that you have been taking care of yourself. Wow. If you have not been able, to, if you're unable to produce that uh, proof, that is an additional infraction. It wasn't like that when I started in the work. So, for example, like for psychologists, it says psychologists strive to be aware of the possible effect of their own physical and mental health on their ability to help those with whom they work. Okay? Maintaining competence means that psychologists undertake ongoing efforts to develop and maintain their competence. When they experience personal problems and conflicts, they are to refrain from initiating any activity when they know or should know. Should know. So we can't even claim, well, I didn't know. They should know that there's a substantial likelihood that their personal problems will prevent them from performing their work-related activities in a competent manner. And when psychologists become aware of personal problems that may interfere with their performing work-related duties adequately, they take the appropriate measures such as obtaining professional consultation or assistance, and they determine in that, in that instance whether they should limit, suspend, or terminate their work-related activity. Right. Yes? It should be. It should be. Yes. So, so some people aren't seeing it. Well, everybody's going to get a copy of this as well. So um, there are a few. There were a few things that I, in, in my in my overachieving, there are a few things that I added to make sure I, I was like a good good presentation. So this this presentation has a lot of graphics, and so it might make it a little bit challenging to to follow, and so. I apologize about that. Um, that avoiding harm means that psychologists take reasonable steps
to avoid harming their clients, their patients, students, supervisees, research participants, organizational clients, and others with whom they work, and to minimize harm where it is foreseeable and unavoidable. So here's what I'll say. Um, I, I provide a lot of clinical supervision, a lot of consultation. You know, as providers, I feel like our culture is, a, you know, we're in, encouraged to pursue a supervision, to, you know, as we get licensed and then, you know, maybe have peer, peer supervision groups at, at, at work or at the agency. I go to supervision every week. I go to supervision every week. And my supervisor holds me accountable. It's not enough to be a good person. It's just not enough. You know, so, you know, even at the agencies, I found that supervision began to evolve in my particular, evolved from clinical supervision to administrative. Those are two very different things. We're talking about how I'm showing up in this case, how the client is showing up, where are we with the treatment plan, where are we with the diagnosis versus how many billable hours did I secure this, this week. That's very different. That's a different conversation. You know, so for me, it's always been important, especially um, in D.C., to invest in outer agency supervision where I could feel safe, where I didn't feel that, you know, my vulnerability was going to be held against me on a performance evaluation or, you know, misunderstood as a form of incompetence as opposed to a clinician who's evolving and continuously learning and open to that process. So I just want to encourage you all, for those of you who have been thinking about it but haven't quite decided, you know, you had, if you really want that push, to create spaces for yourself when you feel like, you know, you, you, you will benefit from it and that you have colleagues who will benefit from it. Um, it's very tempting to push it to the back burner, especially if it feels like that's the culture of the, of the, um, of the agencies that employ us, that when you are standing face-to-face -face in front of that licensure board, the agency is not there with you. They're not. And then they put your name on this horrible registry, and they describe the infraction. So I think clinical supervision is a way to completely, you know, to, to guard against that. When we talk about liability, I think it's a way to guard against that. Um, and supervision doesn't always have to be serious, like any more than therapy sessions have to always be serious. Um, so you can talk about some of the strides that clients make and um, how wonderful it is to bear witness to that. Mental health clinicians do have a history of suicidality. 29% in this particular study said that they had a, a history of suicidal ideation. Um, you know, there's that when we, when we are renewing our licensees, there's that, there's a question that basically asks this, and many of them said that they lied on that question. 6% um, said that they attempted suicide. 59% worked when they were too distressed. And 85% worked at unethical distress levels. Okay, so what's interesting to me about this is that 59% instead of 100% or nearly 100% said that they worked um, when too distressed because to me this, this should be higher. If you're really in touch with yourself, you know when you're stressed. And what concerns me is that the, these clinicians may not even know what their stress looks like. So that's their new normal. And as clinicians, oftentimes we have a high threshold for emotional and emotional pain, for psychological pain, because we're taking all of this in, you know. And so that's the concern here. All right. So I put this here, you know, uh, just to say that um, yes, we are all always works in progress. And you know we, you know the paperwork is always there to pick up, help us pick up where we left off. So I want to just take a quick break, and I want to give you all an opportunity to introduce yourselves. You're like, well, you've been talking to us all this time. Yes, you, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourselves. You can introduce yourselves by, you know, raising your hand if you'd like, and just sharing a little bit about yourself, or what brought you here today, outside of your CEUs, and anything else you'd like for us to share like to share with us at this time. 
I will call on people. No, I won't do that. Okay, let's do this. Why don't you turn to your neighbor, and why don't you tell them where you would go if you had an all-expenses-paid trip? Where, where would you go? <laughs> So, how was that? Good? There was a lot of positive energy in the room. Does anyone want to share what was good about that, that exercise for them? I saw, let me just start off by saying, I saw so much self-care happening in that few, those few little minutes, it wasn't even funny. I saw people drinking their drinks. I saw people um, coloring. I saw people laughing. You're supposed to laugh every day. You're supposed to have one of those gut-wrenching laughs every day. That's a part of self-care. Um, I saw people nibbling on their food. I saw people excusing themselves and going to the restroom. We oftentimes think that these are like minute overtures, but they're really important. They're really important. So when we talk about self-care, I mean, I'll be sharing some of the evidence-based practices and strategies that I learned that I can tell you the, 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 the most um, important ones are the ones that may not have been. I, I would like to see some research about going to the bathroom when you have to go. Okay? Because, you know, you're hanging on that person's word and you're thinking, what's, you know, I'm, I'm trying to hold it together here, you know. Or you get halfway through the day before you realize you haven't drank any water. Yeah. Your mouth is so dry you can't even speak. You know, or you get to the end of the day and say, did I actually leave my lunch at work? Mm -hmm. You're heading home mm -hmm. after work. <laughs> at some point during the day you had experienced hunger. So once you stopped experiencing hunger, you sent your body into stress mode. The cortisol got lit up. So, you know, these are just things to, 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 to think about. Um, and it can be uncomfortable sometimes, too, because if you haven't eaten and, you, you, know, the, you know, the client is looking at your food, I mean, there could be all these kind of weird, interesting moments you don't really feel like sharing or I don't know. Um, that these are all things that you get to kind of explore in, in consultation uh, with peers that you trust. Um, so if you don't remember anything, Let's just try for the next week, for Monday. I'm not even going to say for the next week. For Monday, going to the restroom when you need to, drinking, taking, getting a glass of water when you need, when you need to, and having a bite to eat. Because when your blood sugar is low, you actually now you're somewhat compromised as well, and that sends the body into stress mode. And I'm going to do it with you. I'm going to do it with you, Indisa. In the research, is what's interesting is that you know when we look at the, the theories and the principles that we use in helping clients who are recovering from the debilitating impact and effects, and I have to say the debilitating, dev devastating effects of addiction, there are some principles there that also to apply to us. SAMHSA says that the definition of recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. And so when we start thinking about our self-care plans, that's exactly what we're doing. At some point today, from, from the 9 o'clock to, to now, from, the nine, from 9 o'clock to now, you realize, okay, I could do a little bit better with this. It's been a while since I've been to the Y. It's been a while since I swam. You know, you're beginning to realize that. And we want to make sure that we improve our health because when we improve our health, not only are our clients going to have better experiences, we are going to, we're going to have better experiences with them. We're not going to be so agitated when they come in being there themselves. In recovery, uh, in, in um, addiction recovery, we're looking at health. We're looking at home. We're looking at purpose, and we're looking at community. Um, you know, how many times have you gotten ready to go to work and you realize you don't have any clean socks? You know, you have to borrow from somebody else. Um, you know, you, you, you do make it to the elliptical, and you can't do it the first three minutes because you're so, you're so tired. 
um, and you realize you haven't done it for so in so long. Um, purpose, you know, meaningful daily activities such as a job, school, volunteerism, family caretaking, or, cre or creative endeavors, um, and the independence. You know, for me, as someone who's always f uh, facilitating um, expressive arts work, I do sand tray work with clients. I forget to do my own sand trays sometimes. You know, I should be doing them too. I mean, and then also to community. This work is very isolating. Um, nobody knows what you've experienced you know, in the day, what, what stories you've heard during the day. And it, it's hard to know what to share. And so your relationships and your social networks um, are supposed to be, provide a, a, a sense of support and, and love and friendship and hope that how, you know, how do we get that support when, when our loved ones don't really know the scope of what we're doing, which is why it's so important to, for us to have peers um, that we trust. SAMHSA also, too, talks about the 10 guiding principles of recovery, which are hope, being person-driven, uh, pathways, um, holistic, relational, culture, addressing trauma. So if addicts who are in recovery, if they are addressing their trauma, then maybe we should too. Taking a look at the strengths and responsibility, at respect, so not just respect for others, respect for ourselves. When we go to the bathroom, when we have to go to the bathroom, that's a form of self-respect. When we drink water when we're thirsty, that's a form of self-respect, and it models for the clients as well. And so um, I just wanted to just take a moment, some of you, uh, let me know that you say, well, where are all these fancy graphics in our presentation? It's a totally different presentation. So you all will get a copy of this um, for, for printing purposes. These graphics are really expansive, and it just would have been a lot. So you have more of the, the, the verbiage, more of the content, um, and more of the visual here. Does that make sense? So I just want you to know you'll get that. When we talk about establishing and, and sustaining resilience and wellness, we're going to be looking at strengths. You know, in my profession, in counseling, we're, we are strengths-based. We're not looking at what's wrong with you. We want to know what's going well in your life and how, you know, I always tell clients, how can we apply your strengths to what's troubling your heart? You know, that's what the work is about. We work towards prevention and early intervention. We work, we work towards empowerment. We work towards community and change. Most of us got into this work because we have a social justice compass and we believe everybody deserves to you know, function at their, be, and to be. We believe that every, everybody has the right to be their best selves and we wanna help people get to that place. And I also too wanted to just mention that um, some of the cultures, at least that I'm seeing in D.C., like the public mental health cultures are shifting a bit, um, where they're allowing clinicians to have, you know, work from home day or work four days instead of five, um, or, you know, not on weekends or just having people work just weekends and not during the week. So something has happened in terms of the feedback that agencies are getting, uh, managed health care are receiving about what, um, what needs to happen in order to keep us healthy. And the agencies that are doing well, and, we, and we, we're talking about also to just their, their numbers, their revenue, what we're seeing is that agencies that practice these principles actually gross more revenue. Um, they have higher levels of satisfaction amongst their clinicians, their workers, um, and then also to amongst their clients. So they have a, a philosophy of nonviolence and non-coercion. You know, sometimes, you know, maybe you're being asked to do something that feels unethical, but you're not quite sure how to get out of that, um, or something that doesn't feel comfortable to you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the policies uh, don't seem to be congruent with what the stated values and the way that people interact with you, the hierarchy, the leadership, uh, makes it difficult to ex experience the values as stated. Um, the agencies that are doing well, they identify and eliminate all the coercive practices. They've let them go. They've removed all overt and covert expressions of power, control, 
and they, they routinely review the, work, the rules objectively. They seek feedback from their workers, from their employees, and they integrate that feedback. Right? So there's no point in soliciting the feedback from me if you're not going to integrate it into the policies that affect me. They make meaningful change um, in their environment. So they're installing gyms. They get, they're getting the fanciest coffee machines. Uh, they are you know, buying, buying lunch every you know, once a month. They are, you know, they are taking these steps to make sure that we have what we need to be successful in the work. So now we're going to switch. And I want you, all, want you all to have that framework in mind in terms of like the addiction recovery and what that looks like. Um, those principles, and I found this um, this TED talk, which I think I think I think you're going to enjoy it. Let me just say that, and we'll we'll come back to see your thoughts. Everyone is in the middle of a life story. And your story is being shaped by what you are saying yes to and what you are saying no to. Your yeses and nos are what boundaries are made of. So what are boundaries? How do we build them? How do we heal when our boundaries are violated? And how do we push through boundaries? These questions have been the center of my life and my work. When I was a little kid, and my world was just my family, I was pretty sure we were the only ones struggling with those questions. And then I grew up, and I became a family therapist. And I saw lots of people struggling with these questions. And when I took a detour and ran nonprofits, I saw communities and leaders struggling with these questions. So now I teach workshops and wrote a book to help people answer these questions. And as people answer these questions and learn more about their boundaries, I've watched hundreds of people make the journey from being overwhelmed and exhausted and stressed out to people who trust themselves and are decisive and are committed to healthy relationships. I'm going to share some stories and some tools that you can use to strengthen your boundaries. Let's begin with the most essential boundary tool that everyone has. Take a moment and visualize a compass in your hand. It looks just like this. It has two words on it, yes and no, and only those two words. You use this compass to make your decisions, figure out your relationships, and set your boundaries for your whole life. Today, I'm going to talk about how you can use this compass to place boundaries where you need them the most, lower your stress, and figure out your life's purpose. Now, the key to placing boundaries where you need them the most is tolerating stormy emotions. I was raised by my grandparents, and my grandfather had one way of doing things, his way. <laughs> and when I was 24, he came to me, and he asked me to be the executor of his will. And I asked him, what was it he wanted me to do after he died? And when he told me, I got all this stress inside, because there were things I didn't want to do to other family members on his behalf. <laughs> And I really wanted to please him, but I couldn't say yes to all this stuff. So I told him, no, I couldn't be his executor. And he did what most people do when you tell them no. He got angry. You know, when you listen to your own yes and no, other people are going to get angry or they may get disappointed. Boundary setting will unleash emotions. And yes and no are not feelings. So I couldn't let my fear of my grandfather's anger, nor my desire to please him, determine my boundaries. Now, sometimes your compass is clouded over. 
And you can't see if something is a yes or a no for you. And this happens if you've been ignoring your compass or arguing with it because you don't like what it's saying. Years ago, I wanted to be a writer. And I was very busy working, and I couldn't figure out how writers made time to write and earn a living. So I took this yes, and I shoved it to the side. Those are the writers that are here. <laughs> and, and my daughters and I were attending this uh, writing camp week-long thing for middle schoolers, and I got to go as a chaperone. And one night, this real writer got on the stage, and he told us how he made time to write, what he said yes to with his time, and what he said no to in order to complete his books. He lived very cheaply, and his sole job was writing. There was my answer. So for two years, I saved my money, I lowered my expenses, and then when the time came when I had my money saved up, I devoted myself to writing. <sighs> <laughs> All that work, and in like just a few short months, my yes became a no. <sighs> Writing is a solo sport. You sit alone all day. There I was, talking to my dog. <laughs> oh, this is not the move for me. I'm a people person. So I listened to my no. I went back to working with people, and I saved some of my time for writing. That was a much better fit. Now, if you pay attention to this compass, it just gives you the basic guidance, the yes, and the no it doesn't give you any details. You have to figure out the details. But the thing is, you can trust this compass because it's only trying to do one thing, and that's take care of you. And if you allow your compass and your boundaries to take care of you, it'll mitigate stress. And stress is a very serious issue. According to the American Psychological Association, 50 to 58% of us, I'm not going to say who, are suffering <laughs> from high stress. That's kind of a shocking number. And employers who are listening may want to pay attention to this and think about how important is decision making on the job? Because this compass is highly sensitive to stress. And stress clouds over your compass. I teach people boundary skills so that they can reduce and prevent their stress from accumulating. The challenging thing, though, is that setting boundaries is just a little stressful. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> it's brief stress, though. Like, once you get over that brief stress of actually doing it, you feel all this relief. And I call that brief stress sweating. You're going to do a little sweating when you set your boundaries. I sweat, and I teach this stuff. So let's go back to this compass in your hand. It is only trying to take care of you. And ask yourself this question. Are there ways that you could improve your self-care? And when I say self-care, many of you may think first about what you eat and how much you exercise. And those are really important, but even people who do those really well are going to have high stress if they aren't managing their boundaries. Self-care is a much bigger landscape than eating and exercise. Self-care is how you treat yourself. It's how you find enjoyment, play, happiness, balance, rest, and companionship. I'm the first to admit, though, that self-care can be really hard, and it took me a long time to learn how to do it. In the past, and I like saying past, I was a workaholic caretaker. And back then, I was running an agency that was serving teens who were homeless. It was an agency that I started and I was deeply committed to. And over the years, as the organization grew, it needed more and more from me. So what if I was up night after night trying to make that budget work, and I couldn't a lot of the time? 
So what if I was on call seven days a week, 24 hours a day, year after year, after year? So what if I was getting sick from watching so much child abuse? So what if I actually had post-traumatic stress from it? I ignored my own care until one day I was sitting in this dark movie theater and I was crying and crying. I broke. I couldn't stop crying. And I realized something inside was trying to reach me. And as I listened to my tears, I understood that I couldn't keep running this organization that I started and that I loved. My compass was saying no for my well-being. That was really hard to take, my well-being, up against all these kids who needed help. So I dug deep with my compass about my purpose. And I understood that maybe it had been my purpose to start the organization, but 10 years later, the community loved and could care for this organization. And so I spent a year with my board of directors, and we transitioned leadership to new leaders for the organization. And I want to tell you, it's still standing 24 years now, taking care of kids every day. Well, that's to you guys. Every day and every night, doing exactly what it was designed to do, the way it was designed to do it. And I learned from my compass that other people could take care of the kids and the staff and the organization, but only I could take care of me. And then I had to face my workaholic. Oh, my. <laughs> my workaholic? She's terrifying. She's worse than my grandfather. <laughs> my workaholic never says, oh, take a break. You've done enough. My workaholic is crazy. And she just keeps going and going and going. And I had to intervene with some care for me. And my care for me got better and better, year after year, step by step. Now I challenge myself every day to do, do some of my work and then do something that I love, that I can fit into each day. So I knit more, I hang out with my friends. My friends are kind of shocked that I have time for them. My husband and I, we do less chores and we just have more fun. And my daughters and I are in this ongoing conversation about healthy living as they both grew up and went into healthcare. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> and this summer, on a hot, sunny day, I was watching this eagle soaring overhead at the beach. I remember everything about this day. It was a Tuesday, a work day. I had taken my lunch, I drove four minutes from my office to the beach, and there I was, taking a 45-minute lunch break, watching this eagle and listening to the waves. Now that's recovery. <sighs> now I need to warn you, even if you're doing all the boundary pieces, like you, you've separated your feelings from your boundaries, and you're doing some good self-care, and you're really listening to your yes and no. And maybe you've recovered from workaholism or numbing out. Even when you do all these pieces really, really well, there are going to be some things that are going to challenge your boundaries. And they're going to make things extra hard. None of us are immune to health issues, to a financial crisis or to a family member who has an addiction problem. And some of you are dealing with those struggles every day. Some of you are dealing with really tough challenges at your job every day. There are three things that you can do to support your compass. First, increase your self-care. You may already be doing some self-care, but you need to step it up. When your loved one has breast cancer, 
What I always see is your care for you goes down while you care for someone else. And taking that time to care for yourself may seem completely ridiculous in the face of such a big challenge. But I want to see the care for you go up while you care for someone else so that you're a stronger support in the long run for you and for them. The second thing to do is to reach out and build a web of resources. Your compass may not have enough information to guide you through the challenge that you're dealing with. We're not all experts in everything. Find people who have this expertise, join a support group, see a therapist, take a class, reach out. The third thing to do is to really focus on choosing your responsibilities and limiting your time during a challenge. During a challenge, we have like tons of extra responsibilities just coming down the hill at us, and you can't do it all. You have to decide what you will and won't be responsible for, and you have to let go of some of the rest. And nowadays, our technology has created this illusion that you are all a device that is always on. And now more than ever, you need to be careful and be protective so that you have some time to recover during a big challenge and times when you're not doing ongoing problem solving. All of you are in the middle of a life story. And your story is being shaped by what you are saying yes to and what you are saying no. <laughs> if you shut out the noise and listen, you're going to find yourself going through life with less stress and profoundly in tune with your purpose. Thank you. So now what you're going to do is you're going to turn to your neighbor and share um, your impressions of the TED Talk, uh, what, you know, what spoke to you, what you disagreed with, your impressions. I can always tell when I'm among my people because we just talk and talk. We love to talk. I'm like, I'm with my people. Oh my gosh. Um, so, and I love hearing you talk. I love the buzz of us like connecting with each other because as soon as we leave out of here, we'll be giving, giving, giving again. I wanted to share just briefly um, some of the evidence based self care strategies that actually are congruent with um, some of the principles that we described, some of what um, Gilman described. And um, want you to be thinking, this is not about what you need to do. It's about figuring out what's going to work best for you. So there's three. There's three evidence-based self-care strategies. So the first one is um, called habits, going tiny. And I, I have to tell you, many of us that are in this work, we go hard. We're like, zoom. We don't want to talk about two seconds. We don't want to talk about three seconds. We want to talk about two years. We want to talk about 20 years. And in this, um, with this strategy, you're only focusing on 30 seconds. You're only allowed to focus on 30 seconds. So first, you choose a habit. I suggest a habit that is from your morning ritual or your evening, your after work ritual, and something that you do every day and something that you do less than 30, 30 seconds or less. And then what you're going to do, and it has to require a little bit of effort. I, this is the time where you have to put your overachieving self like in the car seat. All right? And once you have established what that, what that habit is, and you realize that it, you know that it requires a little bit of effort, you're going to do it regularly every day for 30 seconds. Ideally, it's something, a habit that you're actually trying to build. And this is a cognitive behavioral uh, technique that is being used a lot in recovery addiction, in addiction recovery. Uh, because 
If you can stay away from your addiction for 30 seconds or less, maybe you can stay away from it for 31 seconds or less, 31 seconds or more. So you're building. And uh, when I was having trouble getting to the gym, my, my mentor used to say, Xanthia, just put your tennis shoes on. And I was like, with socks or just, <laughs> just put the tennis shoes on? And she said, just put your tennis shoes on. And I said, this is dumb. I, I, don't, I don't understand what, you know, what you're asking me to do. She said, just put them on anytime. She understood that that 30 seconds was going to be meaningful. So after a while, I'm walking around at, after work in the house with these tennis shoes on and my work clothes. Okay, So I take the work clothes off, but I still have the tennis shoes. And eventually, of course, the work clothes are you know, replaced by something more comfortable. And after a while, it's like I'm sitting here on the couch in workout gear. <laughs> I'm with the tennis shoes on. I might as well go to the gym. So I just want to give a plug. And, when you, and the thing about it is that once you have completed this, you have to celebrate. You have to celebrate. Because that's getting the muscle memory going for you to be able to say, you know, this is my endorphins are being released. I did something I said I was going to do for myself. And, and you celebrate. It can be something very, very minute. Maybe you do like a shoulder shimmy in the, in, the, in the mirror. It doesn't have to be big, but just something that fully acknowledges what, um, you know, what you've done. Another new technique that I'm actually seeing a lot in DC, especially with the families that make their way to my practice, uh, a lot of parents are utilizing interactive journaling. And it's so interesting because I remember you know, being in school and being afraid to add color to my notes or to add pictures and just trying to stay within the lines. And now, there's a whole industry that's emerging around interactive journaling. Um, what it does is it, 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 it's a practice that effectively assists individuals in making positive and lasting life changes. It initially began in the education, edu education community, and now it's moving towards other, other industries and other fields. There's a level of motivational interviewing because it's, it's encouraging you to connect with the co concepts that make sense, that, that resonate with you. And uh, there's a level of structure. So it's like a call and response in writing. Uh, so sometimes the kids that I see will bring their interactive journals and what they've been working on with their parents. And they're getting to know each other on a different level. Um, it works also, too, very well with adults. And so it's just something to think about. There are apps. There are books. There are so many resources. Uh, around an interactive journaling and you know just want to encourage you to to check that out um, also too, nature immersion nature therapy is one of the modalities that we practice at my practice um, when people are in nature the, it, there's so many benefits to the brain walking in nature um, decreases stress um, it increases our short-term memory so have you ever been on a walk and you'd be like oh yeah Something you were trying to recall, like all morning, you're outside, you get a breath of fresh air. There's actually a TED talk about the power of taking a walk when you have a problem, when you're trying to figure something out. Um, and you might want to take a look at that. I, I will share that, that resource with you as well. It restores our mental energy. You feel, you know, you feel more alive now. And it increases our cognition, and our, it increases our, our creativity. So when we're able to solve that problem, it's because that, that right brain has been activated, the, the part that kind of helps us um, engage in, in creative activity. OK, so I'm going to pass this. So now what we're going to do, I know we are kind of getting, you know, we have just 30 minutes. So we are going to practice some self-care now. We've had two self-care breaks, and we're going to have a third one because the presentation is about self-care. So we're going to take 10 minutes. Um, if you'd like, go outside, talk to the trees. Okay. You can stay and chat with your colleague. 
you know, sometimes you haven't seen your colleague. Wait before, I, I want to just, one moment. Everybody's excited. I'm excited for you. Um, for some of us, this is the first time we're seeing our, like, our favorite colleague in a long time. And it's just like, what have you been up to? Now you can talk, have that talk. Um, you can check in on each other. You can draw. You can start working on what your self-care self plan might look like, a very simple mini one. I encourage you to you know, follow your body compass. The one thing I will say is that with the nature, it is immersive. And so you might look at your client and say, oh, it's 20 minutes after she said 10 minutes. Um, so just be sure to practice a level of consciousness. And we won't be locking the door. So you're always welcome back in. OK? All right. All right. Let's come back together. More buzzing. I saw some people outside. I saw people laughing and talking and um, getting full. I wanted to just share a little bit about my own self-care, too. Um, I. Um, last year, I completed my certification for sand tray um, therapy, which is an immersive um, uh, modality that, um, you know, I've been studying it for a long time. And in order to get certified, you have to do your own work. So I completed that last year. So I love doing sand tray. Um, I am also, too, very intrigued with Snapchat. When I'm irritated, I go on Snapchat and like and talk to myself in one of the faces, and for some reason, it makes me feel better. Um, uh, this picture, actually, that uh, that one at the bottom there with the um, crane. Interestingly enough, I was doing my meditation. I do a walking meditation in the mornings, and I was on the bridge and was actually filming this. The uh, uh, the sunrise, and I have no idea how it happened, but it be it was a video, and this crane just flew away. It was right under my feet, and it was like one of the most majestic experiences that I ever had, and um, it was a reminder of how important self care is. When I'm rushing around life, I don't get to I don't see those kinds of things. I just don't. Um, I love traveling. I don't travel as much as I used to, but I do love traveling. That, that photo was taken in California. Uh, I also, too, love TJ Maxx. <laughs> I'm Marshalls. So um, I got those boots at Marshalls. <laughs> I also, too, love using music um, as a means to transition. Uh, I want to let you know that for each any time you're working with clients, you have to have a ritual before and after those sessions. Even if you tap your left, left ear t three times and you wiggle your right, it's a reset. Wiggle your right arm, it's a reset. So sometimes, you know, for me in my practice, clients can bring their lizards, they bring, you know, their pickle and peanut butter sandwiches, they bring their, their pets. Um, you know, they have their playlist. It's for 50 minutes, they get to be fully themselves. Um, and so it's important to, to help them transition out of the space and to help me transition into the work with the next person. And so whatever it is that you do, you should always, that's 30 seconds or less, OK? Uh, so music is a big part of the way that I self-care. Everybody in here should have a theme song. <laughs> OK, I'm dating myself. Allie McBill always had her theme song together. And so the theme song is uh, something you can do before you're getting ready to go into a, a stressful meeting or after a stressful meeting. Um, something that makes you feel good. Uh, singing loudly in the car in traffic, that is self-care. To the point that somebody looks at you <laughs> and you're like, hey. <laughs> That's self-care. That's radical self-care. Here at the bottom is Mars. He is eight months. Um, and he uh, is a very big part of our model. He n now knows which clients want to engage, what their engagement levels will be with him. So he knows which ones to approach and which ones to leave alone. 
Um, he knows which ones to hop on the couch with because they cry, um, and they like to pet him while, while they're crying. Uh, so just in terms of you know, showing up, I would have never have imagined that this would have been where my life was when I was working in public mental health. I kind of thought that that was it. I thought I was going to be the director of like a public mental health agency, and I was really excited about that prospect. Um, I didn't know that my leadership was going to take this turn, and I'm so glad it did. I have a four to six week waiting list, um, and we don't accept insurance. Whoa. So I, uh, I, I, in order to for my self care submitting claims and all of that, I'd rather a client pay me a dollar or pick a, pick a flower out in front of my, well, don't pick my flowers, but yeah. pick, <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying. You know, give me something else. That's the way that I take care of myself. I find it very, it's very difficult to know that I did work and I showed up for a client and then to not be compensated for it um, when I, also to trying to keep my, the doors of my practice open. So this is just an, you know, I just want to encourage you all to, to highlight your self-care. I'm sure when you think about it, you've been, you haven't, even brushing your hair, that's self-care, okay? And um, I want to remind us, we're clinicians, we're not magicians, you know, we're, we're human. I think a big part of self-care is uh, being, being humble, that's one of the things I'm finding is acknowledging I can't do it all. You know, clients will sometimes that's so you're you're so young. You know, Miss Anthea, are you sure you can't meet with me at seven or eight o'clock at night? No, my bones crack when I get out of the bed. Now I cannot meet with you at seven o'clock at night. <laughs> I can't. You know, it's about being honest with myself. Um, let's see. There's another one. Uh, they interviewed a therapist, a psychologist, and they found that many of them. These are some of the things that they did, and I wanted to just share it with you because sometimes you're already doing something. You're not giving yourself enough credit. Um, some of them, what I found interesting, some do something that's completely separate from being a therapist. Like one of the, one of the gentlemen I supervise for clinical supervision, he loves dogs, so he walks dogs like two or three days a week instead of seeing clients. Um, I have one client, I mean one supervisee who well, I've actually, I'm very interested in maybe becoming a shampoo girl at like a, you know, hair salon, because I would get to have interaction, but it's not so serious as, it's not as serious as therapy. You know, so you get to be, you know, driving Uber, you know, you get to be ex excited. That's one of the ways that people take care of themselves. Um, uh, positive self-talk, I write on my mirror. Everything I've ever written on my, my bathroom mirror, mirror came to fruition. I really believe in that. Uh, my my um, social justice campaign is manifesting dopeness. Uh, please follow us on Instagram because um, I really believe in, in seeing it and, and becoming it, all right? Um, scheduling your breaks and scheduling the time to take care of yourself. It can't be, I'm gonna get my nails done sometime this week. No, what day and what time? All right, and, and if you want to, make sure you share it with a colleague so that they all hold you accountable. There are so many um, support groups. You can start a support group. Um, there's so many listservs uh, where, where people get you know, support. Uh, prayer and meditation, people said that you know, they, they could not do this work without that. And relaxation was also too an important aspect of the work that people do. Um, there was one other thing. So also too now with self-care, it's interesting. There, is, there, is, there are no self-care resources for clinicians, like for solely for clinicians. I found that so interesting. You know, my sister and I, we, we, ex we researched extensively and could not find anything. Um, but we did find, I did find a few. Uh, there is this aloe bud, which is a self-care um, pocket companion. It reminds you to eat. Um, it reminds you to take, spend some time in nature, and it gives you these prompts. There's the Grow app. Um, these are also two free downloads. Um, and this is a mobile app, too, that does similarly what, um, what the aloe bud does. Um, Vision boarding, mood boarding. There are lots of apps where, you know, back in the day we used to kind of pull out our, you know, our collage materials and get our poster boards together. And I still think that there's a lot of value in that. That for those of us who can't, um, doing the visual, um, 
vision boards, you know, electronically might be an option for you. There's also to the Mind Body Green uh, podcast that I think uh, n that has a lot of content around uh, self care, and this the Grow app I think is also to uh, d specifically designed for caretakers. You remember she mentioned mm -hmm. in the video uh, mm -hmm. people who are doing a lot of care, caregiving, you know, for those of us who are doing this work and then we have an aging parent at home, you know, we have to have that self-care. Yes. So that one should be the Grow app. Grow app for self-care. That's for caregivers. Okay. And so, um, let's see. Okay, so we have about four more minutes. I always like to pride myself on early dismissals. <laughs> and so I'm going to stop here. I want to, I know it's not you know, 10 minutes, but every minute counts is more than 30 seconds. I want to thank you all so much for coming out on Friday. There's a reason why you were here outside of the CEUs. I really enjoyed the positive energy. Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook and tell people about us. This is really my platform. I feel very strongly about making sure that we get the support that we deserve. We are the bomb.com. Thank you for everything that you do. I see you, I hear you, and I hope that you have a good rest of the day and I'll be around for any questions or any feedback about the presentation. Give yourselves a round of applause.